thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Dustin Bird, uh, Professor of Philosophy and Religion, Olivet College, and the founder and co-director of the Institute for Critical Social Theory. And today I have with me Dr. Rudolf Siebert, Professor Emeritus from Western Michigan University, the Department of Comparative Religion, <coughs> he taught for over 50 years. Uh, he is the founder and director of two international courses, one in Dubrovnik, Croatia, and the other in Yalta, Ukraine, and the Crimea. He has written dozens of books, 40 books, I, I, if I remember correctly, and hundreds of articles on critical theory of uh, Frankfurt School, critical theory of religion, uh, works on Hegel, uh, political theology, psychology of religion, and, and right now he's working on a book on the authoritarian personality. He's a foremost developer of the critical theory of religion and society. And he's recently um, recently retired after 54 years, but he continues to write. Uh, he's also a member of the Institute for Critical Social Theory, uh, which is founded in 2021. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Siebert. Thank you. Thank you. So today what we're gonna be talking about is Freud and the Frankfurt School. Uh, and I thought instead of, you know, um, going over a whole litany of Freud's biography and everything about him, because I think most of our watchers are going to have a good sense of who Sigmund Freud is, I thought we'd jump right into his connection to the Frankfurt School and how the Frankfurt School has utilized Freud or incorporated Freud into their analysis and their critique of society and politics and, and, and history and on and on. So um, when was Freud's psychoanalysis introduced to the Frankfurt School? Well, the Frankfurt School, the name came only very late. Originally, it is, of course, called the Institute for Social Research. And that was founded shortly after World War II in the University of Frankfurt, Goethe University, Johann Goethe University. And uh, so shortly after the World War in the Frankfurt University, and um, this university itself was very young. It was only 20 years old, and it was mainly a business school uh, as it was founded, because Frankfurt was very much a business city and a banking city, and so the university fit there. And so after the war, there was a businessman, a Jewish businessman, Weil and his son, and um, he had made a lot of money through trade. He had brought food to the starving Europe during the war. And um, so he now looked for investment for his uh, money. And the connection was made between the father Weil and the son and Horkheimer. And uh, so, but before Horkheimer already, the Institute started with two uh, directors who both were ill and could not really function. So in that sense, Horkheimer became the first head of the first director of the Institute. And there was another Institute, a psychoanalytical one, the Freudian Institute. They were separated, were separate, but the uh, Psychological Institute moved into the new building, which Weil established and um, so the two different uh, institutes were in the same building in Frankfurt, which then was bombed out in 1944 in an American bombing attack on Frankfurt, one of many. And uh, so, but it was rebuilt then again by the military government in American military government at by the city of Frankfurt. And so there is a new building today which is still there and has been just renovated recently. So that was the beginning. And Freud was uh, very important for the psychoanalytical part. And there was an early cooperation between Fromm and, uh, and Horkheimer. And of course, the um, Institute also, uh, Horkheimer was Jewish, the founder was Jewish. So it was very much a Jewish uh, 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 issue. And it was done in defense, of course, against the rising nationalism and the rising racism in the post-war Germany and the Weimar Republic. <clears throat> and they somehow uh, anticipated more things to come. There were people 
the Frankfurt University who would say this Adorno, we have to put him against the wall and shoot him and so on. So there was a strong anti-Semitic uh, tendency in the university already and all around the country. So against this, then a combination was made between Freud and Marx in the Institute. And the Freudian theory then um, was developed in terms of this authoritarian personality. So the authoritarian personality was theoretically somewhat rooted in the Oedipus complex and how the Oedipus complex uh, is to be dealt with, how it is to be resolved, either in a sadistic way or in a masochistic way, either by killing the father or by subordinating once for, uh, for the father. And uh, so in the background is, of course, the whole idea of an original uh, horde of people with a father and a community of brothers. And these brothers have a hateful or loving attitude toward the father. And out of this uh, combination, out of this syndrome, um, somehow a theory was developed about the authoritarian personality, uh, first by Fromm, um, who uh, interviewed 8,000 workers in order to see how many authoritarian or democratic personalities there were. And uh, so then later on that was taken up by Adorno uh, with, a, with a work on American workers, which where there, there were so many authoritarian personality in the labor unions in San Francisco and in California that it was never edited, uh, was never published. It um, is still with the Löwenthal estate in California, in Los Angeles. And, but then there was another one made more universally and that came out and under the title authoritarian personality. So the authoritarian personality plays an important role in the defense which the Institute established against the first wave and now against the second wave of authoritarianism and uh, fascism. So, um, so there was an early uh, cooperation, even locally in the same building. And um, the friendship between Fromm and Horkheimer was very deep. And so nobody who left the Institute was, was so painful for Horkheimer as when, when Fromm left. So was from was the was from the original source of of introducing Freud into the Frankfurt School. Yes, I would say so, and also with introducing from was very devoted Jewish Jewish believer. He started with a, a work on Judaism. He also had a book on on Jesus in Marxian and in Freudian terms. But he was also particularly the promoter of this idea of a mod magic helper. The magic helper, that means Freud's father figure, turned into the magic helper. And this magic helper idea then uh, out of this was born the, uh, the authoritarian personality, which is looking up to this strong man, to this father, to this magic helper. Still, in the end of the war, I found people, simple people in Germany, even after Stalingrad and Kursk, who believed in Hitler as this magic helper. He would have this miracle weapon by which the, one, the war could still be won in January 1945. <laughs> so this idea is, is uh, the core of the whole work which the Frankfurt School did in defense against the authoritarian or the fascist or the Nazi personality and movement. Yeah, and, and there was, um, I think there was a, some kind of dispute, right, between other members of the Frankfurt School, was it Adorno and Marcuse maybe, uh, and, and from in terms of how they conceptualized Freud, um, didn't, didn't, 
from moving to some kind of um, neo-Freudian interpretation of Freud, where the others want to have a more, let's say, concrete, a more literal understanding of Freud? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> that is the whole issue of revisionism. And um, this revisionism uh, turned around the idea of ide idealism, that in a certain sense uh, from, you know, returned again to idealism, or <clears throat> that he did not take seriously enough the instinctual basis uh, which uh, <clears throat> Freud has, so that Freud was more biological, in the, particularly an emphasis than late of the death drive and the aggressive element, which then plays a great role against in terms of the authoritarian personality, which is very aggressive and very death friendly. <clears throat> Even the Catholic Church talks today about our culture as an oversexed death culture. So this death element in fascism, this friendliness toward death um, is somehow un anticipated in this theoretical work. So the charge against Fromm was that of revisionism. That means a return to idealism. And there one has to be careful because idealistic elements are present, of course, also in Horkheimer and Adorno, but it was more than they could tolerate the return to idealism and the diminishment of the instinctual basis, which was very important for Freud and his Trinitarian structure of the psyche in terms of it and of superego and ego and the outside reality and the reality principle. So <clears throat> it was the, also the emphasis on the unconscious, which uh, then was diminished. So the um, uh, Marcuse then later on, but also Horkheim and Adorno defended the original biological position of Freud. But when, when they charged uh, from in terms of revisionism, they of course revised from as well as Marx in a certain sense too. And from a Soviet point of view, the whole Frankfurt School was revisionistic. in terms of Eastern Marxism. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, it, it, it seems like, <coughs> you know, that the Frankfurt School utilized Freud throughout their their analyses of contemporary society, the necrophilic aspect, as, as you were talking about, you know, which Fromm does a really good job of articulating. Um, but it also seems that, you know, that there was this complete, I just want to say this, 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 breakdown and understanding of Freud uh, between what we could say the more clinical side of, of, of represented by Eric Fromm and the more philosophical side by the rest of the Frankfurt School. This is a division that in psychoanalysis, I think, remains today. Um, there are some who would say, you know, well, Adorno and Horkheimer and, and uh, Marcuse uh, were not clinicians. And so therefore, you know, they weren't good Freudians. They didn't understand Freud because they weren't in, you know, uh, closed sessions with patients and whatnot, like, like Eric Fromm was. And then there's the other side of psychoanalysis that said, no, it's not only a tool for understanding the individual. Freud also conceptualized it as a way of understanding society, um, almost like the philosopher Freud. Um, and there's that internal antagonism. I think that, that, people try to um, impart upon the Frankfurt School, because clearly those who remained in the Frankfurt School were certainly more on the side of the philosopher Freud, or they utilized him more in that sense, as opposed to being a clinician like, like Eric Fromm. I mean, do you see that as, as being some kind of legitimate understanding of Freud, that he should remain in the, as a clinician, or that he, you know, his work I mean, can be used? There's, you know? some, there's some truth, of course, to what from, uh, you know, says in his defense that he was a practitioner. So he um, did psychoanalysis in New York for about 20 or 25 years and developed a new, a new type, uh, the hoarding type, which was rooted in the original authoritarian type, uh, evolved out of it. But one has to be careful, of course, with Freud and philosophy, because Freud distinctly did not want to be a philosopher. So 
that uh, spoke for Fromm's interpretation. But also um, Freud had a philosopher and the philosopher was Schopenhauer, Arthur Schopenhauer, <clears throat> the arch enemy of, um, of Hegel. Uh, he once Schopenhauer put his class up at the same time of Hegel in the University of Berlin and in order to see how many students would come to him and nobody came. And so he got angry and he uh, left for Frankfurt, stayed in Frankfurt, wrote his one book, The World as a uh, <coughs> Representation, as, um, uh, uh, as Imagination, as Will and Representation. And uh, so, so Schopenhauer, uh, Freud says uh, once when he discovered late the death drive, he wrote to a Swiss friend, a woman in, 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 in Switzerland, um, now we are back in the camp of Schopenhauer again. So he had contact with philosophy uh, after all. And so one could then with some legitimacy speak about um, not only about Freud's practice, but also Freud's, Freud's theory or his, his philosophy. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because, you know, the Frankfurt School is always thought of as being some kind of a neo-Marxist. Usually it's, that's that's the moniker people uh, attach to it. But it's also very Freudian. But but Freud himself was quite critical of Marx and, and the Marxist tradition because he thought somehow, you know, man's biological instincts and things like that would somehow undermine the collective effort to bring about a, a utopian worker friendly, you know, justice filled society that somehow that was a doomed type of project because of man's innate nature. Right. Um, so am I correct in that? Yeah. Well, one has to be careful, you know, in terms of calling the Frankfurt school Marxist or Freudian and so on, because there was a whole, world behind the Frankfurt School. So there was German idealism from Kant to, to Hegel. And then there was, of course, Marx and Freud. They were called um, jokingly in Frankfurt. The Institute was called Kaffee Marx uh, before the, um, after, after the First World War and before they were closed by, by the Nazi government. So, uh, <clears throat> but of course, um, some people even say that the name Critical theory is just a cover name for historical Marx, uh, historical materialism, so for Marxism. But it is more truthful, I think, to say that Marx played a great role, Freud played a great role, but beyond that, um, Horkheimer did his dissertation and uh, uh, habilitation on Immanuel Kant. So <clears throat> Kant was really, you could say, First of all, Horkheimer was a Kantian <clears throat> before he was anything else, a Hegelian and so on. So they were eclectic in that sense. They took from the idealistic as well as from the materialistic tradition. Yeah, now, moving on to a little bit other something, you know, psychology has come a long way since Freud. I, I always think of Freud as kind of this Freud and, and Breuer who came before him as this, these founding fathers that kind of broke the, the gate to the mind, you know, and they opened up the door to it. And psychology and psychotherapy and, and on and on, all the different branches of, of psychology now have come a long way, uh, including in neuroscience and things like this. And so this has caused a lot of people to say, you know, Freud is simply passe that yeah he opened the door but you know he only stepped one foot in and he had some interesting insights but you know most of it is is um it, it won't prove to be true uh, in any way shape or form and i think there's some resistance to that and the constant freudian le renaissances that we have are, are always pushing back against that because there are ways of revising freud in many ways so do you see psychoanalysis as being passe or is it still a useful way of understanding the the psyche the mind and understanding society well <clears throat> of course first of all freud did not have a sociology so um, and of course marx did not have a psychology um, this is a little bit exaggerated because marx did of course have a little bit of a psychology and freud did have a little bit of a sociology and so on 
but the emphasis of both of them was different. So therefore, when um, Reich, Wilhelm Reich and Marcuse and Fromm and Horkheimer and Adorno, when they combined the two, that was a good uh, move. And I think that this still has validity today. So in any case, the uh, Frankfurt School people still take Freud seriously. And they look at what came from it as a little bit watered down of things. So the loss, for instance, of the unconscious with Skinner or so, that would be a watering down of the original um, psychoanalysis, <clears throat> which Freud developed only in Vienna. He was very famous already for brain science in France before he became famous for psychoanalysis in Vienna. So, but Breuer did, uh, that was not sufficient for him. He departed for him and uh, then uh, developed a method where language and memory played an important role. So yes, the, uh, I think the Frankfurt School people still take Freud very seriously and don't think so highly about what was developed out of him later on, particularly also economic reasons which play a role Today, when you want to have a Freudian psychoanalysis, you have to go to New York and you have to pay much. And so no insurance will pay for it. <clears throat> and therefore very often we have five sessions of something and uh, people then go out again into the real world and five weeks later, five, six weeks later, they come back again. So you have this going around all the time of people going out and in and out uh, that may save money in the first place, but um, in the long run, the insurance companies would probably uh, uh, save money if they would have a Freudian analysis, which goes to the change of the character rather than just the behavior. <laughs> because you can, uh, as everybody, a sadistic person, can change his behavior and look very friendly and so on until the character breaks through again. So, therefore, to have this character analysis is just uh, too expensive for most people. It is some kind of an elite thing, which an elite bourgeois can afford, but which is not um, open for normal people. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, I think it's pretty clear the political economics of, <laughs> of, especially here in the U.S., which, you know, if you have a lifetime of developing a, a neurosis and, and having these experiences that that only cement the neurosis and make it more and more part of who and what you are, and then you get, you know, the insurance company that'll pay for one session per month for maybe five months, and then the expectation is either you're done with it or you go on the pills, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, and so in this way, it certainly is the case that psychoanalysis, which has shown, I mean, there's been quite a few studies actually that shows the effectiveness of psychoanalytic treatment when it's done for long and extended periods of time, because that's how much time, you know, an analyst and needs to, to deal with their traumas. But um, the pills are so much more convenient and the insurance company would rather pay for a pill than psychoanalytic treatment. Um, that's certainly a way in which uh, the political economic system impinges on the mental health of, of us here, at least in America. Um, of course, we should uh, be open and uh, in that sense that the human psyche is so complex that there is probably room for all the differences of approaches which people have. So um, therefore, Skinner is very strong in our area here. And there's certainly a lot of good things are done in, the, in terms with the, in, in the, with the method of Skinner and so on. So that is true for all the other schools. Uh, so one should be somewhat tolerant um, or appreciative of the other approaches as well. But as far as the Frankfurt School is concerned, they are uh, still very much, uh, you know, um, enthusiastic about uh, Freud as well as about Marx. And of course, both have been somewhat repressed. Uh, Marx more than Freud and uh, of course Hegel too, they have become persona non scrata because of different reasons to lift up the, um, uh, the cover, the conscious or the unconsciousness 
from unconscious motivations or so can be very painful for, for society, particularly when one wants to cover up a lot of things in politics or economics, and then somebody comes who wants to make everything conscious and thinks that is the real humanity, a conscious humanity that can be dangerous. Or if a philosopher comes and says, Pantare, everything flows, also the ruling classes come and go uh, when the ruling classes always want to uh, emphasize to their, uh, to their people that th this system is eternal. <clears throat> so then those philosophers or those psychologists become very easily persona non grata. Yeah, it's certainly clear. Anything that or anyone, any voice philosophers, psychoanalysts that show that the the sickness of society, if you will, right, like, yeah. like like you know, from said uh, that we're we live in the insane society. Um, and Dr. Martin Luther King actually, when he was here in Kalamazoo, made a reference to that. That um, you know, when he was talking about psychology, and he said that it, there's a word in or a phrase in psychology called well adjusted. Um, you know, and everybody wants to be well adjusted. That 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 means to be healthy. He said, but in a sick society like we are, um, where we're defined by you know, Mister, a society of guided missiles with misguided men, for instance, was another phrase he said. But when we're in that society, to be well adjusted to that society is to be sick, just as a society is sick. And so, to be maladjusted is the healthy thing to be. Which brings us to the next question: Does does psychoanalysis is it an attempt to uh, adjust people to the world as it is to to integrate them into it to to reconcile them to the you know the the the, the horrible painful distorted way our society is or is it an attempt to liberate from them from that society to somehow make them maladjusted to the sickness of society well I mean, there is some, you know, reason to say that Freud, like every philosopher, has some positivistic elements. And so you could say, you know, that Freud wanted to make people able to stay in a marriage, to stay in a relationship, and to keep a job. So if you want to get psychoanalysis down to simple elements, you could say that is what he wanted that he wanted that a person by becoming aware of his own it, his aggressions, his death drive and so on, could create around himself a certain culture sphere in the madness of society. And he could uh, somehow be, create a human world for himself through self-knowledge and so on. So now uh, in terms of if this, uh, means adjustment now. Um, there's another <clears throat> possibility. For instance, the attitude of Freud toward uh, Lenin. He was rather favorable for Lenin's uh, attempt in, in Leningrad and in Moscow, but he had certain doubts. So in the doubts were in terms of his own biological determinism. He thought that humans are determined by the it, by their instincts, and that therefore, if there would not be any class struggle anymore, there would be gender struggle or other forms or um, race struggle or, or whatever. We see now the sensitivity of our society when we look at the struggle against the uh, critical race theory that people want to get it out of schools and so on. And the charge is the critical race theory shows bad things in the history of our country. And when you teach that children, then children will not love their country anymore. So it is better that we don't talk about 400 years of slavery <coughs> or about the class situation in the country so that people love their country. So that is, a certain attitude toward education. How should one educate? And should one just tell them the good sides about the church or the state or the country? Or should one also bring the negative things in? What is, what is the right thing to do? And definitely 
one has to be very careful about the negative side. It's also in the family. Do you say something negative of what has in the, happened in the family or should you be quiet about it? <clears throat> Certainly, if you are not remembering the negative, you will not be able to change it for the future. So, but how this is been done, uh, that it is done at the right time, at the right age, and in the right words, so that there cannot be any doubt about the love of the country or the love of the church, but that in spite of the fact that you love your country and your church, there are bad things which have happened. And it should not be the enemy who tells you about it, but it should rather be the friends who tell you. Yeah, it always seemed to me that a, a healthy consciousness can deal with, you know, deal with understanding the complexities of, of history, the, the slaughter bench of history, but also the great accomplishments of history, you know, because <laughs> we emphasize too much or pathologically emphasize the negative people, you know, start to suffer from oikophobia or this hatred of everything that's ours. So our civilization, you know, there's a lot of Westerners that condemn the West for, you know, nothing good comes to the West. The West is horrible. So anytime, you know, a Western country is just like in the World Cup right now, people will, on principle, support countries outside of the West, primarily because the West were colonials, right? So um, Western colonialism, imperialism. So that, that that oikophobia becomes pathologically everything is bad, right? For, right, for right. us. And the other side is nationalism, the other pathology right. of nationalism that know everything is good. We're the superior society, we're the superior civilization. We actually, you know, developed everything that the other parasitical people have to rely on. So both of them are are pathologies, I think, that somehow the, the patriot or the constitutional patriotism, as Habermas would say, would allow for the understanding of both the good and the bad. But that takes a healthy conscience. Right, exactly. Right. And and, and it's it difficult to to walk that tightrope psychologically, I think, for individuals, because it's so easy to fall into one of the other camps. And it's difficult to maintain both these antagonisms in your mind without uh, trying to reconcile them falsely by falling to one of the other camps. Yeah, particularly when the negative then is uh, used in order to feed hostilities and uh, in order to attack the other and, and so on. So, and, but there must be uh, also an issue of forgiveness, of course, and reflection and making things good as far as this is still possible. So the struggle between Hegel and Schopenhauer was about that. Schopenhauer was not a bad man. Schopenhauer taught the compassion with the victims, but he talked about the cursed optimism of Hegel that Hegel tells you when it's not so that Hegel did not see the horror and terror of history as Schopenhauer does. We have places in their writings where they almost say the same thing as far as the horror is, is concerned. <clears throat> but then Hegel tells us to transform the consciousness, to make a turn of consciousness and remember that reason governs the world or that providence governs the world and that God is the negation of the negation. That means that the negative is negated and that the good goal will be reached in history and so on, which then sounded for Schopenhauer as if it was just cursed and he condemned it and um, Hegel never answered the whole thing as far as I know. So yes, so that there is a balanced type of a view because the two poles can drive each other nuts. So, Therefore, one has to be at a rather moderate view of it. So also that one really is able to look at nationalism and racism in a scientific way that one can find the causes where it comes from. That means that in a certain sense, if one is a democratic person, that one tries to understand how people can become that way and that one can help them also in a good and friendly way uh, to find their way because they may harden even in their authoritarian position when they are attacked and then there is no hope at all for a resolution. Of the Oedipus complex, by the way, in terms of the critical theory, 
how the Oedipus complex is to be resolved if in a sadistic way or in a masochistic way. <clears throat> that is the decisive question. <clears throat> and that it is well itself, it is all that is, of course, would be the task. And one should not push the authoritarian personality into the corner, because if he's put in the corner, he becomes really insane. So hopefully the other side will think the same way in terms of convincing a democratic person. For instance, like we have it in Germany now, <coughs> that the Germans suddenly talk, talk about a Wehrhaft, that means the defense strong type of a democracy, that also a democracy is not Bakuninism, it is not anarchy, that there is a democratic authority, and that this um, authority has to be able to defend itself when it is attacked as it was planned in, in Germany recently, and with us as well on January 6th. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, right there. I mean, there's a lot of pushback right now in in democratic societies by those who would like to undermine and or cancel democracy to institute some kind of authoritarian uh, perspective. You know, I think a lot of that gets back to the psychological problems that people are having living in this this free society. Uh, you know, and how we define freedom is just certainly up to question, but living in the societies that are democratic, at least. Um, which goes into, you know, Freud's book, Civilization and Its Discontents, that for some people, there's almost too much freedom, and that type of freedom breeds complexities, and those complexities are hard to deal with because they're ambiguous, um, you know, nothing seems to be solid anymore, things just slip through your fingers, you know, now we're in the post-truth eras where no one knows, you know, what to believe anymore, and so they're looking for some kind of um cancellation of that in the sense of you have a strong authority who now tells you what's what and it's easy to submit to that you don't have to do the hard work of of thinking or living in that ambiguity um you know so I, you, you see that i think in a lot of societies complex societies multicultural societies multi-confessional societies um you know just recently in the news uh, Nick Fuentes, you know, this white supremacist had dinner with the uh, former President Trump. And if you listen to Nick Fuentes, he believes in Catholic supremacism and white supremacism. And, and it's it's this authoritarian way of ordering society that that no longer allows for the complexities of the democratic, the Volks, the or not the Volksgemeinschaft, but the Willensgemeinschaft societies, the the willed communities. And I think they're, they're, the psychology is there, I think, is pretty apparent. It ends the problems of, of complexity, of the grayness of society. Things are now black and white, and that's easy to navigate, I think, for a lot of people. For other people, it's, it's impossible to navigate in that. I wouldn't want to live in an authoritarian society, you know, but other people would. Well, I lived in an authoritarian society, and a very far developed one. And of course, it, it does solve some problems. I mean, um, Hitler saw all these parties in the Weimar parliament and they didn't uh, get to anything. They didn't solve the problems and they became impatient and he made jokes about them and so on. And so that way he undermined it that democracy as the West understood it uh, was simply not, uh, not uh, practical enough. And so he convinced people and threw all these democratic parties out. And they even helped him to, like the center party helped him into getting, uh, becoming a dictator in a legitimate way. <clears throat> so the, so one has to admit then too that so very often freedom is misunderstood, that one has only rights without duties, or that these rights are absolute, that is not true. And out of this irrational freedom, then much nonsense can come. So one has to see that uh, Hegel has a nice uh, version in the beginning of his philosophy of right, 
where he says that somehow <clears throat> the uh, abstractions can move between subjective reason and objective reason, that there is an objective freedom and there is a subjective freedom, and that somehow uh, ideologies, abstract ideologies, move between the two sides so that people become blinded for that what is called objective freedom. That means the family, civil society, the state, history, culture, and so on. There is an objective side to things, but the subjective freedom can be blinded and then is lost in itself and produces um, uh, irrational conditions. So yes, we have the freedom of speech, but it is not absolute. So if there, somebody shouts fire in a room full of people and they panic and uh, trample each other to death, obviously there isn't a limit to this. If in Paris we have a tense situation between the religions, then to put a bomb on Mohammed's head and so on is simply criminal. When there is a limit to <clears throat> that one's own freedom does not destroy the freedom of the other. So Schopenhauer and Hegel defined the original sin as becoming happy for the price of the happiness of the other to be free in terms of the freedom of the other. That is the original sin. So uh, therefore, so it's the Christian example of Jesus, who rather dies for others than let others die for himself. That would show the right way um, in, in terms of this uh, chaos which we have. So one has to reflect on both sides. And is there any way to uh, in terms of Habermas or his friends, um, that one can uh, achieve or reach some kind of an objectivity and objective consensus in terms of discourse and so on, so that the individual in an existentialist way is simply left alone with his own will, creates his essences uh, arbitrarily, but there are no essences anymore. They are just existence without any objective essence whatsoever left. So <laughs> both sides have to be reflected on. We cannot return to old ontologies anymore, that is true. But we have to find a new way to find an objective hold. Yeah, and do you think psychoanalysis has any any part in finding that new ontological understanding, especially of, of us in this post-secular society where religion, you know, it's still around, it's still here. In many cases, it's really phony, but um, it no longer is the the guide of a society, right? But yeah. somehow, it, you know, we still have the same psychological needs, but religion that used to meet a lot of those psychological needs are no, is no longer believed in. You know, God is dead, as Nietzsche would say. We can, can't really believe in it after science and in uh, modern technology and things like this. So can psychoanalysis have any kind of role in that? Well, of course, uh, Freud came from a pious Jewish background and uh, a lot of his dream analysis sounds very much like the interpretation of the Torah. <clears throat> so there is Jewish inheritance in there, but he himself, uh, knows only to deal with the subject and to free the subjects from uh, illusions and delusions. <clears throat> but when you want to free people from illusions, you must know what the non-illusions would be somehow. In order to call anything an illusion, you have to know somehow um, what a non-illusion would be like. Uh, for, for Marx, there's something similar. It's, it's also the Jewish background. <clears throat> and some people think that Spinoza, for instance, came through in Marx. And um, so that's uh, Spinoza's pantheism is what Marx was really concerned with. Because also with him, if he is critical of negative conditions, he must have some kind of a vision of what the positive would be. 
So if he negates the private appropriation of collective labor, he must somehow have an idea what a collective appropriation of collective labor would be. <clears throat> One cannot talk about the untruth without have some inkling of what the truth may be. Yeah, you know. In that sense, Freud was really clinical. So um, that means as he helped ego <clears throat> to balance it and superego, um, he tried to free them from their illusions and, and, uh, and uh, particularly delusions even. And as far as religion is concerned, of course, Freud was very critical. Right, very critical of religion. Like, like Marx before him, like Feuerbach before him, he essentially essentially forwarded an abstract negation of, of religion. And yet somehow, you know, I think it was in the, the Hebrew edition of Moses and monotheism where he says, someday people will realize just how Jewish I am. Oh, yeah. And when I read that, I, I don't see it as Jewish meaning, off, you know, some kind of, you know, biologically Jewish or culturally Jewish. I actually read that as, as somehow religiously Jewish. He's still religiously Jewish. And I argued in one of my books that it has something to do with tikkun olam, this healing of the world, that, that there is this, you know, in Judaism, there's a special responsibility of Jews to heal the world. And even though Freud had no time for what we could say manifest religion, you know, he certainly had it latently in psychoanalysis as his, his, his psychoanalysis was an attempt to heal the individuals around him. And hopefully he hoped that it would become almost like a secular religion as a way of healing, as a way of, of you know, uh, overcoming these neuroses that people have that they develop in the broken society. And so he still has this Judaism, even when he advocates an abstract negation of religion, it had really some disdain for religion. I mean, not it was disdain almost as a belief system, not as a cultural system, system that produces things. I mean, look, when he was in Rome and he sat uh, there and, and looked at the Moses statue forever, and almost, you know, people say he thought of, of himself as a kind of a new Moses. There's a, a religious, you know, um, spirit there, I think, that still remained with him, even though he gave up on religion. Some kind of a replacement of confession. Mm -hmm. he, he could he could not forgive, you know, like a priest would forgive sins or whatever. But he tried, you know, to free people from what could be called sinful. Yeah, and I, that was one of the critiques that a lot of religious uh, scholars had of psychoanalysis towards the beginning because they thought it was a threat. You know that that the people would go to the psychoanalyst to work through all these problems that they have to to unburden their soul, if you will, and they would no longer seek you know the office of reconciliation or confession, or they would no longer go to their ministers and their pastors and their rabbis or whatnot, but they would go to the secular psychoanalyst. Yeah, so, but in the meantime, they have learned to cooperate to each other. So, if somebody comes to confession, you know, and uh, um, has uh, thinks he kills the father, but didn't, then he should be sent to the psychoanalyst. But when the psychoanalyst, you know, finds somebody who had really killed the father, he would send him to the father confessor because he cannot forgive sins, real sins. So, yes, so in the meantime, there's a lot of cooperation, but it also happens still that psychoanalysis are excommunicated. So, Recently, a priest who was also a union uh, had to leave the church. And so the tensions are still there, but open people have begun to cooperate. Yeah, I think once the division of labor became pretty solid in understanding of, of the difference between the role of, of clergy and the role of a psychoanalyst, I think once those those roles became more solidified the idea that psychoanalysis for instance was a threat to religion dissipated quite a bit religion is not going anywhere in in the sense of it's not completely collapsing in the modern world right now 
it's yeah. still around. It's still going to be here. And so is psychoanalysis and psychology and psychological treatment and psychotherapy, for instance. So the less antagonism now than before, for sure. So uh, here's a good question for you. Um, does Freud understand the dialectical nature of religion uh, like Adorno and Horkheimer and Benjamin did? I mean, they understood that, that there were certain emancipatory elements within religion and there were certain repressive elements in religion. Um, and therefore they wanted to determinately negate and preserve and elevate um, and translate in many ways uh, the emancipatory elements of religion into political philosophy, for instance, and economic philosophy, cultural philosophy. Uh, I, I, does Freud see religion in the same way as that? Well, uh, on the surface, not. So it's the thing of supersession, the supersession of religion. So, for instance, to take the religious idea of the love of the neighbor, and transform it into solidarity as the labor unions did and so on. So I think in that sense, Freud did not do that. But in a certain sense, you know, his own psychoanalysis is a supersession of the confessional. And uh, so it is a way how <clears throat> the confessional could survive in a postmodern world, as Habermas said. So um, now religious people may not be very happy with this, that religion uh, survives, but not in a religious form. Um, Marcuse has talked about that too. He was asked in East Germany uh, if there would be religion in the, in, in the uh, new world, which he foresaw. And uh, he said, yes, there will be religion in a new non-alienated way. So I don't think that um, Freud would go that far. <clears throat> but as you said rightly, his Jewish heritage goes into his very method of psychoanalysis. The way how he interprets dreams is the way how the rabbi interpreted the Genesis. So <clears throat> in that sense, I think there's the same possibility of a supersession of religion in a non-religious form in uh, the postmodern world. Right. So it wouldn't be entirely accurate to say that Freud was anti-religion. I think he's more anti-religion than pro-religion, obviously, but it seems ambiguous in the sense that he had this uh, almost hatred not a pathological hatred but a disdain for re religion as it is practiced in you know the, the 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 obscurantism and things like this that you would find in religion he had no time for that he was a man of science reason rationality um but at the same time it, it seems like he inadvertently as you said did precisely or almost as precisely what adorno and harkheimer and benjamin did and he translated certain latent aspects of religion into psychoanalysis, um, not to create a new religion, but almost in a way uh, as to rescue that form of religion within the modern world, within that modern scientific rational world. Yeah. Yeah. That can be said, yeah. So I think we, yeah, we, are, we are at time. So this was have been a wonderful conversation, uh, Dr. Seward. I hope uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope we're able to enlighten some of our listeners on Freud and the Frankfurt School, and this is stuff that you've written about over the course of the last 50-some years, so I encourage people to look at uh, Dr. Siebert's bibliography, uh, articles, and many, many books uh, on this subject, and, and go from there. Thank you so very much. Thank you, and have a wonderful day in a wonderful holiday season. Yeah, happy Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, too.